When they see our veterans that were there, they just wanted to touch them and to thank them, you know, for their for the, the sacrifice. Um, so it, it really goes, it, it really catches you. It really, really does. So all of my experiences that I've had uh, with these types of delegations have left me just a different person. I returned to Canada and just appreciate that much more, the freedoms that we have today. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio and welcome to Profile. June the 6th will be the 80th anniversary of D-Day. A turning point in the Second World War, the invasion would mark the beginning of the end of Hitler's Nazi regime and pave the way for the liberation of both France and of Europe. This year, Canada's delegation to D-Day ceremonies in Normandy will be led in part by the Veterans Affairs Minister Jeanette Petipa-Taylor. She is the sixth Liberal to hold the portfolio since the Trudeau government was first elected in 2015, and recently I had the opportunity to sit down with the Minister. During our discussions, we talked about the D-Day anniversary and why she says it is an honour to do what she is doing. Here now is Jeanette Petipa-Taylor in Profile. Minister, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I want to begin with your impressions of the job, because as you and I are speaking right now, you, you've held this portfolio for about 10 months, uh, not the first minister to, to be appointed the portfolio during uh, the, the Liberal time in government since 2015. Are you enjoying the position? I know that there's so many challenges with it, but are you enjoying it? You know, I get asked that question so often, every day really, and people sometimes look at me with a bit of a, a an impression, like thinking that I'm going to say the opposite, uh, but I really am enjoying, thoroughly enjoying this portfolio, probably because of my background, having worked at the RCMP for a number of years. The RCMP may not be uh, the military, but it's certainly a paramilitary type of organization. Uh, and also with my background in mental health, I feel like I, I really much feel at home in this department and really enjoying the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I read somewhere that you've also described it as an honor to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, it, it really it's an honor and a privilege. I mean, as you've indicated, I've had a number of portfolios that I've been the minister of, but this portfolio, it's very much a service delivery portfolio. It's really close to the veterans that we work with and Canadians. And I think that's the part of the job that I really do appreciate. Also, it's not always easy. There can be some challenges, uh, but again, if we can just make things better for our veterans uh, and their family members, uh, to me, it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about the challenges in a bit, but you know, I, I wonder how much of your enthusiasm for this role, you, you referenced your, your background work, uh, your, your prior work with the RCMP, but at the same time, you yourself have talked about having family members who served in, in the armed forces. I'm sure that comes into play when you think about this role. Yeah, absolutely. When I met with the Prime Minister last summer and he asked me to take on these responsibilities, um, again, it's a true honour to be able to serve in this capacity. But again, uh, looking at my family members that have served, my father's brother uh, served in the Second World War. Uh, he passed away in Italy. I never got to know him and really nor did my dad because my dad had been adopted uh, um, through the years. Uh, I have a brother that served as a peacekeeper uh, in Cyprus. And I also have three nephews, uh, two that have served that are retired and one that is still presently serving. So there's a long military history in my family as well. Uh, I see the challenges uh, and the sacrifices that, that they've made and that their families have made. And I certainly want to make sure that as a government, uh, they, we are here to provide the help and support that they need when they return home. Mm -hmm. As a government, but you know, I'm, I'm wondering what it's like as a family, because whenever, especially in your role now, when you see commemorations for Remembrance Day, when, when you represent Canada at different uh, functions across the country and around the world, do you recall those family members? Do you, you and your siblings talk about? Because you come from a large family, the youngest of 10 children. Absolutely. Uh, just this year was my first uh, Remembrance Day a national event ceremony that I attended. Uh, and again, I mean, I think of my, my young nephews that have served. Uh, and also, uh, it was the 10th year anniversary of Canada's withdrawal of, of Afghanistan, and we had a commemorative ceremony here in Ottawa. And I have two nephews that have served in that mission. Uh, and actually, that day in question, I asked one of them if he wanted to join me. He wasn't available, but again, uh, he was near and dear to my heart because, again, I certainly recognize the sacrifices that he and his family have made during uh, those missions. Were you moved emotionally by it? Absolutely. Again, uh, I'm a bit of a softie, uh, and when I attend these types of events, you know, the, the personal connection comes and touches you. 
but also when you see many of the young families that were there, uh, some widows that were there with their children, uh, some that, that have lost their husbands or wives. Uh, it's very touching, it's very personal, and again, it's truly an honour to be serving in this capacity because I get to meet the best of the best Canadians, Michael. I really do. I get to hear their stories, I get to hear about their challenges, um, but again, um, the sacrifices that these folks have made in their family members, they're the best of the best Canadians. Well, the best of the best Canadians, and you will be encountering survivors of what's been described the greatest generation because uh, as we approach June, as you know, we, it will be the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, the start of it in Normandy. Why do you think it is important for Canadians to mark and remember that day? Well, I think if we ask most Canadians when it comes to uh, D-Day and the Battle of Normandy, most Canadians are aware, perhaps not of all the details of it, but they certainly have heard of this really important mission. Uh, this was probably one of the most complicated missions that anyone has ever really encountered. And for this mission, this 80th anniversary, I think we have to remember that for this delegation that we're bringing down, it will probably be the last time that Canada will actually be bringing veterans uh, that served uh, in the Second World War in that particular mission. So it's going to be very touching to have uh, between 18 and 20 uh, veterans that are going to be with us, family members as well. Uh, and it's important to remember the sacrifices that they've, that they've made for the freedoms that we enjoy today. So I've had the privilege and opportunity of taking part in these types of delegations in the past, not for D-Day in Normandy, but uh, more, um, it was the 75th and the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. And I can tell you, uh, attending these events with the veterans themselves is really, really special. And I think it's important that Canadians will have an opportunity to see them because these events will be televised as well. And uh, it's important to hear their stories and their sacrifices. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've watched past D-Day Remembrance Ceremonies and, and you see the veterans, and, and as you say, fewer and fewer each year. And yet, without a doubt, when, when they are gathered there in Normandy and they, they hear the, the sound of the trumpet play, you can see the tears come to their eyes. The emotions are still there. Has there been any one experience, any one story that, that resonates and you remember the most? To be frank, Michael, uh, the two delegations that I attended, uh, I just got to spend a lot of quality time with these veterans, and many of them had shared their stories for the first time uh, with strangers. Many of their children that were accompanying them had said, like, Jeanette, it's the first time that I'm hearing Dad talk about, you know, what he went through. Uh, there's a few individuals as well that we were able to walk on the beaches uh, in Dieppe with them as well holding their hand and um, they would again share with us that it was the first time that they had returned uh, to the beaches. It just, it, it touches you. Um, the other thing as well, just, and again, I can kind of get teary eyed when I think of it, but to see the French when they, when they see our veterans that were there, they just wanted to touch them and to thank them, you know, for their, for the, the sacrifice. Um, so it, it really goes, it, it really catches you. It really, really does. So all of my experiences that I've had uh, with these types of delegations have left me just a different person. I return to Canada and just appreciate that much more the freedoms that we have today and thanking these great Canadians, we certainly is the, the least that we can do. Yeah, and one of the resonating points is, is when you think about the sacrifice that they made and they made it at such a young age. We're talking about teenagers. Can you talk to us a bit about preserving history, because if there are stories that family members have never heard before, what does it say about Canadians and the stories we've not heard yet and talk about in order to commemorate and honour those who served? So commemoration certainly is a key part of the mandate of Veterans Affairs Canada. And again, as we've indicated, many of these uh, great Canadians um, are ageing, and we have to make sure that we continue um, to recount these stories and to learn about their stories. The nice part about this delegation that's going down uh, for the 80th anniversary this year, perhaps not a part of the formal delegation, but we have 1,300 children from across uh, Canada that will be attending the events uh, in Normandy. Uh, so as a result of that, these are going to be great ambassadors. I've inc I met with them a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting and met with over 300 New Brunswick students that will be down there. And they were asking me, you know, uh, words of advice. And I really encourage them, take the time to speak to these veterans. Uh, you have so much to learn from them. And that'll be a very important part, you know, of your trip and of your journey. Also, these young kids that are attending um, 
the, uh, the tour as well. Many of them have actually adopted a soldier that they've discovered in history books and they're actually going to be um, doing the same, um, they're going to be on the same journey that these young soldiers were on, uh, you know, back 80 years ago. So I think these types of commemorative events are really, really important and again, they'll be able to come back and to share their stories that they've learned from, you know, these Canadians as well. Veterans Affairs Canada knows that commemoration needs to continue. We need to continue to commemorate our First World War, our Second World War, our Korean War, but also our modern day uh, soldiers as well. Uh, I think we do a, a decent job at um, the First and Second World War, but I think that we, there's more work that needs to be done with respect to commemorating our modern day veterans as well. And Afghanistan was an example of that this year, with it being the 10th year that Canada withdrew its troops from Afghanistan. We wanted to make sure that we commemorated that because again it's a part of our history that we can't forget. You can't forget and, and there will as you say it be a delegation of uh, both veterans and young people going to, to uh, D-Day ceremonies in France. What else can we expect from Veterans Affairs, from the Canadian government to, to mark the anniversary? Yeah. So the big part, the signature event, as I said, is really um, gonna, we're going to be having the delegation that will be attending. Uh, we have, as I've said, between 18 and 20 veterans. And I say that because of the age of the veterans, uh, we have to make sure that medically they're cleared to come with us. Uh, but we're well on our way in making sure that they'll be well supported down there as well. I also have to say that when Veterans Affairs is planning this type of delegation, uh, we have all of the medical practitioners that are with us. We have doctors, nurses to make sure that there's a full team of support there with them. While that we're going to be um, overseas as well, there's a number of events that will be taking place. Uh, Canada's signature event will be on Juneau Beach on June the 6th. And uh, again, we'll be attending many cemeteries with respect to wreath laying ceremonies. And again, many opportunities to engage with our veterans. The highlight as well for many of these veterans as well is speaking to many folks, uh, local folks from the area. Um, our veterans become rock stars when they're there for the week during this delegation. Um, the French just want to touch them. And uh, it is so genuine and so sincere. We'll, see, we'll be seeing a lot of Canadian flags down there, uh, probably the same amount of Canadian flags as the French flags. So again, they really want to honor uh, you know, the Canadian heroes. Across the country, we recognize that not everyone can make their way um, to the international events. So Veterans Affairs Canada will be sponsoring many uh, national events as well. The signature event this year will be held in Moncton, New Brunswick in Victoria Park. And there'll be again a delegation of veterans that will be down there. But also across the country, uh, we've encouraged many legions and many organizations to really highlight this 80th anniversary. Uh, and Veterans Affairs Canada is working with a number of uh, organizations uh, across the country. You know, uh, stories of ourselves, of our country, they're unifying aspects of, of being Canadian. And, and in this time when there's such great polarization, have you thought about the, the potential for Canadians to rally around D-Day ceremonies as a way to perhaps bring down the temperature and remember that at the end of the day, we're all Canadian? Well, I think so. You know, I, I really think that, you know, we have to use all opportunities in order to do that. And I think if we can just stop and look at the sacrifices that these men and women, you know, have made, uh, you know, for our freedoms, um, we have a lot to thank them for. And we certainly hope that folks are going to take that moment to reflect on exactly that. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the 80th uh, anniversary of D-Day, but, you know, 1944 was also when uh, Veterans Affairs was created by uh, the Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, uh, in order to, to serve veterans returning from the, from the war effort. When you meditate and think about what Veterans Affairs was then and what Veterans Affairs is today, how do you think it has evolved to, to meet the needs uh, of the, the Canadians who are coming back home? Sure, so I think we even have to st take a, a step even further back. Um, if we certainly recognize that many Canadians participated in the First World War. Uh, and we had approximately 162,000 Canadians that came back disabled as a result of the First World War. Back then, however, when they came home, we provided them with pensions for their disabilities and death benefits for those who didn't come back home. And that was kind of about it. Uh, if we come forward though uh, in 1944 after the Second World War, we had approximately a million Canadians that returned uh, from that war. 
that's approximately 10% of the Canadian population. So back then, um, I have to say that our services did evolve because not only did we want to provide them with those pension benefits, but we had many uh, serving um, veterans that came home that perhaps were not disabled and wanted to kind of return to their work or, or wanted to start a new job. Veterans Affairs was created back then not only to serve the disabled, but actually to serve all veterans that came back home. So that was really a shift, if you will, with respect to the types of services that we offered uh, to our veterans. And as a result um, came the uh, creation of back then uh, the DVA, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, back then, if we look back, uh, they provided, sure, pensions and supports, but also education benefits, uh, health care services, because again, back then, health care wasn't free for all Canadians. We didn't have uh, access to Medicare services. So we can see that a lot of programs evolved to make sure that our veterans were able to reintegrate uh, into civilian life, and also to make sure that they received the training uh, and training benefits, education benefits. So the, the creation of uh, the DVA back then, we started seeing the evolution of those types of services. Now if we fast forward to where we're at today, uh, I think that our services continue to evolve. But I also think we can really thank the veterans back after they arrived from the Second World War for the services that we as all Canadians receive today. When we look at free health care services, I think there's a direct correlation between what we provided to our veterans back then. Um, and the list goes on and on. So with respect to the evolution of services, again, we look at the needs of the veterans and also the needs of their family. Because when veterans serve, their families serve with them. And as a department, we have to be you know, um, prepared to provide them with the help uh, and services that they do need. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself best fitting in then? In, 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 yes, you're the minister, but how do you think your contributions might make things better for Veterans Affairs? Uh, good question. I think every member um, arrives in a portfolio and we have our different skill sets, that's for sure. Uh, when I arrived in Veterans Affairs, I certainly don't have the attitude that I know it all. I have the attitude that I have a lot to learn from those on the ground and those being our veterans. So when I um, started uh, in this role, my number one priority was to engage with veterans. My mother always told me, Jeanette, you have two ears and one mouth and I have a lot to learn. And I went out on a journey and really met, if not with hundreds, with thousands of veterans across the country. Uh, this past September, uh, this past March, actually, we actually hosted a veterans summit and a female veterans uh, forum as well. So we had approximately 300 veterans that attended these these four days in total, and it was really important for me to hear from them what is working and what can be improved upon. Um, and I think my skill set is really being attentive to their needs. Uh, I'm an action-oriented person as well. Uh, and I'm really proud of the work uh, that is being done at Veterans Affairs, but I think we can always do better. Uh, but again, what the first thing that we need to do is to hear from those that are receiving the benefits. Uh, so that is a skill set that I bring uh, to the table. Uh, I like to work with stakeholders. Again, being a frontline service provider, I think that that skill set as well has helped me tremendously uh, in this role. I have a background in mental health uh, and working with folks in the area of substance use and addictions as well. And again, I think that I'm able to understand the plight and the struggles that many individuals go through. So if I can leave this department, um, you know, a bit better uh, in making sure that our veterans have access to the benefits and the services that they need, uh, I'll be grateful for my time here. Yeah, and to fill in people at home, you, you did have a full career as a social worker before entering politics. So, so in a lot of ways that, that is applied. But when you, when you talk about uh, listening and hearing what works and what doesn't work from veterans, let's break that up. What do they say is working? Well, for oftentimes I think uh, we sometimes hear of the stories uh, that perhaps don't work for veterans, let's be frank. Uh, we don't hear of a lot of the good news stories. And I can tell you, Michael, when I attend many events, I have so many people that come up to me and whisper in my ear, you know, minister, thank you so much, or thank my caseworker, that we've been able to provide them with the help and the support that they need. I've met with many RCMP members. I've met with many veterans that told me if they didn't receive the services from Veterans Affairs Canada, they wouldn't be alive today. Just last week, I met with two veterans that are doing some incredible work uh, with veterans uh, on the streets, and they've walked the walk, they've, and they can talk the talk. But they told me personally that if they hadn't received the mental health benefits uh, and the services um, and the drug treatment services that they needed, 
they wouldn't be alive today. So there's a lot of good uh, that the, the department has provided. We've made some changes when it comes to making sure that people have access to the mental health benefits immediately when they ask for them. We need to meet people where they're at uh, and when they want those services so we can always make some adjustments. Uh, those are the, the, the good news stories that, uh, that we work on. But again, there's always some challenges. You know, there's some individuals that because of the complexities of their files that they bring forward, sometimes it takes longer to adjudicate those. And I can recognize that it is frustrating when they have to wait for benefits. And when I say that we can always do better as a department, those are the stories that we also have to hear. Um, you don't, as a minister, sure you want to hear the good news stories, but if we don't hear the challenges on the ground, I'm not able to ask those tough questions to see what changes can be made. And I always say, my staff hear me say, we can always do better, we can always improve upon our services. And that is the approach that I take in coming into this portfolio. Now, in the mandate letter that you ended up inheriting from your predecessor, there was the reference to the backlog in terms of, of cases making their way through the system, that there were thousands and still in the waiting, the processing time was, was not meeting the standards set out by Veterans Affairs itself. Is it because of the complicated cases there were backlogs or is it more than just that? Actually it's more than that to be very honest. Um, if we look back in 2014, the Veterans Affairs Department, um, the government of the day had slashed a thousand Veterans Affairs positions, number one. So there was, um, we didn't have a whole lot of extra staff on hand. Then from there, uh, 2015, 2016 on, uh, we've seen an increased number of benefits that were available for veterans. And as a result of those additional benefits, since 2016, we saw a 61% increase in people applying for benefits. So when you have more applications that are coming in, again, you have sometimes a backlog that incurs. And as a result of the increase in applications, uh, the department has increased its budgets by $11.5 billion since uh, 2016. And that amount of money is for direct benefits and services to the veterans. So as a result of that, we certainly were dealt with the backlog. I'm pleased to say, however, that we've made some additional investments in hiring more staff. Uh, just last year, again, we were able to extend uh, that investment to make sure that we have more adjudicators, more case managers to go through uh, that backlog. I'm happy to say that we are almost there. Uh, our service standards at Veterans Affairs Canada is that for 80% of our cases that we can have a turnaround time of 16 weeks of processing time. Uh, and again, we are well on our way in making sure that we, that we meet those service standards in the very near future. The other 20% though of those files, those are the files that are oftentimes just more complicated. There's more perhaps medical uh, documentation that's required or whatnot. But again, making sure that we meet our service standards continues to be my top priority and we are well on our way. Now, in reference to the mandate letter, the, the other portion of the mandate letter that stuck out for me because there are many points in it, uh, was the fact that, that your role is also ensuring that everyone is treated equally by Veterans Affairs, and that is members of the LGBTQ community, the 2S uh, community, uh, visible minorities, racialized Canadians, and also women. Uh, and when you think about that challenge, about making sure that there's equity in the system, how does your background in, in, in being the president for, in New Brunswick for, as advisory council for the status of women, how does that affect what you do on the ground as Veterans Affairs Minister? Well, again, making sure that our equity-deserving groups have access to the appropriate services uh, is top of mind for myself, another priority of mine. And yes, having been the chairperson of the New Brunswick Advisory Council on the Status of Women for a number of years certainly, again, provides me with a great insight with respect to some of the work that needs to be done. Making sure that um, we talk about gender-based analysis and always having that gender lens with all of the policies that we have and programs and services at Veterans Affairs is top of mind for me. And it's not just about checking a box, Michael. We really have to make sure that we have that de gender lens and looking at how do these policies impact women or 2SLGBTQ community, Indigenous populations, and so on. Uh, and that is why that we have made some adjustments and some changes within the programs. To give you an example, um, when it comes to Veterans Affairs and veteran, uh, female veteran population, we have approximately 15% of the Canadian Armed Forces presently that are women that are serving. So that same number equates to veterans itself uh, at Veterans Affairs Canada with respect to our clients. Uh, but 
so often the policies that we've put in place were for you know our male veterans that came forward. So we really had to just take a look at our, our disability benefits, if you will, to make sure that we are properly adjudicating and evaluating these benefits. So that's the work that continues to be underway. Another group as well when it comes to our victims of military sexual trauma. Uh, many individuals have left the Canadian Armed Forces, predominantly women, a lot of them, uh, come forward to Veterans Affairs Canada for benefits as well. Uh, and some of their disabilities are a direct result of the military sexual trauma that they went through. So it's important to make sure that we have case managers, uh, folks that work on the ground that are prepared and have the skill sets to work with survivors uh, of sexual violence. Uh, and again, we have to make sure that our benefits and programs are tailored to meet, to meet their needs. We've put in place a team uh, to specifically work uh, with victims of military sexual trauma and also a lot of our female veterans as well. So again, to make sure that you know uh, people have the skill sets that are required uh, to do the deeper dive that is sometimes required because we want to make sure you know that everyone you know has access to these services in a timely fashion. Recently as well, I had the privilege and honor of meeting uh, with um, the group um, of the Rainbow Purge, uh, the Rainbow Veterans, I should say. So members of the LGBT community that were purged uh, from federal positions just because of who they loved. And uh, many Canadians aren't aware of that history as well when it comes to that dark stain that Canada has, you know what I mean, within our history. Uh, but again, a group of great Canadians um, you know, the, the group of uh, Rainbow Veterans were the ones that brought forward the class action lawsuit. Canada was able to settle that, uh, but I was able to take part in some uh, activities with them. Just last week, we uh, did the groundbreaking ceremony for the monument that is going to be erected here in Ottawa. But again, we have some Canadians here that they have every reason in the world to be bitter, you know what I mean, with how they were treated. But these are folks that are so hopeful and just, again, want to make sure that everyone, you know, has um, an opportunity to serve their country just as they want it to serve their country. So again, in this role, I have an opportunity just to do some pretty cool things, to meet some pretty cool individuals. And I'm just really proud and privileged to be a part uh, of this process with them. You know, as you, you lay out all the challenges that you're trying to meet here, how important is it to get it right when, when you consider the recruitment challenge that D&D has and the cultural change that it's trying to, to bring through the forces, how important is what you do towards increasing recruitment and affection again for Canadian forces? It's an excellent question that you ask and when I meet with veterans, there's a gal that I met at the summit a few months ago, she said it best, when we start with recruiting, we have to start preparing people for transition. And she's absolutely right. You know, if we treat people well when we recruit them and also provide them with the help and guidance that they need when they're transitioning out, they're going to become the greatest recruiters that we have. So again, we really have a lot of work that continues to do with respect to changing, um, you know, the military culture. Uh, we've done a lot of great things, uh, but again, uh, we need to ensure that um, the Canadian Armed Forces reflects the Canadian diversity out there. Uh, and that is the challenge, again, uh, that we are facing, but I think that we are up for. Uh, an article I was reading uh, when you had uh, taken on this new role, a, a veterans advocate was enthusiastic, was excited for you to become Veterans Affairs because this advocate was believed that you would bring to the role a compassionate perspective. Does that encourage you? Does that challenge you to, to meet a standard that people out there have of you? Expectations are high, Michael, and that it always weighs heavy on me for sure. Uh, but again, I am passionate about this and really wanting to move the needle. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I'm excited and I'm energized. And that's what I tell my, my team at Veterans Affairs. Uh, I just see so many opportunities out there. Uh, and my role as Veterans Affairs, I simply want to make sure that our veterans, when they contact our department, are going to receive the best service uh, possible. And again, if there's any policy adjustments that we can make to help serve uh, those that have served our country so well, uh, I'm up for the challenge and that's why I continue to be really excited about uh, the months and year ahead. And that was my discussion with Jeanette Petipa-Taylor. A reminder, June 6 will mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day and we'll have special coverage for you right here on CPAC. I'm Michael Serapio for everyone here at the Cable Public Affairs Channel. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.